Tonight's program is sponsored by Bethel's CARIV Inclusion Committee. If you're not familiar with the CARIV Committee, we do a lot behind the scenes to help make our synagogue more welcoming to all, whether it is differently abled people, members of the LGBTQ community, interfaith families, people who learn differently, and Jews of color, which brings me to tonight's program. We are so fortunate to have Rabbi Zach Sitkin as the moderator of our discussion with the talented Kendall Pinckney and Heather Miller. Kendall Pinckney is a Brooklyn-based theater maker, creative producer, and rabbinic student at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He works and creates art at the intersection of race, religion, identity, and sacred text. He has most recently been featured in the acclaimed new Israeli docu-series, The New Jew with actor comedian, Guri Alfie, Saturday Night Seder and the Unholier Than Thou podcast. His broader collaborative works have been presented at venues such as 54 Below, Joe's Pub, LABA at the 14th Street Y and Two River Theater to name a few. In addition to his creative work, Kendall is the founding artistic director of The Workshop, a newly launched arts and culture fellowship for professional creatives from JOCISM, meaning Jews of color, indigenous Jews, Sephardi and Mizrahi backgrounds housed at JTS. <coughs> Excuse me. He has served as the rabbinic fellow for the Jewish arts and culture organizations Reboot and LABA, and as part of the spiritual direction team at Amu, the Jews of Color Torah Academy. He is a fifth year rabbinic student at JTS, where he is a Wexner Davidson Fellow. Kendall is a 2017 recipient of the New York Jewish Week's 36 Under 36, and a graduate of NYU Tisch Graduate Musical Theater Writing, MFA. Welcome, Kendall. Heather Miller is an educator and rabbinic student who is passionate about creating embracing spaces in both the religious and secular parts of her life. As the president of her conservative synagogue in Brooklyn, she strives to build a community that is safe for all the intersecting identities in its membership. Heather merges her skill sets to work on committees and projects with USCJ, UJA, Partners at JTS, Jewish Education Project, Jews of Color Initiative, and JCC Association to help move this work forward in Jewish spaces. Heather is the founder of The Multitudes, where she designs and facilitates workshops for synagogues and school communities that help cultivate a more racially inclusive lens. She was awarded Metney's 2020 Ernest L. Rothschild Leadership Award and is honored to be in the fourth JOC only cohort of Ben the Ark's Selah Leadership Program. Her favorite role of all, however, is as the mother of three amazing boys who were proudly descended from both freed slaves and Holocaust survivors. Welcome, Heather. We will do a Q&A at the end of the discussion Please submit your questions in the chat function. Now I turn the evening over to Rabbi Sitkin. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I just want to start by saying to Kendall and to Heather on behalf of this whole community that we're so grateful for this opportunity to be in conversation with you this evening. Um, we It is part of our mission to build an inclusive community. Um, and we want to learn. We see this evening as an opportunity for us to to learn and to grow from hearing your stories and from hearing the work about the work that you do in this world. Um, and so I think it would be really helpful for us on this in, in this conversation tonight to hear a little bit about, you know, about you and who you are first before we start anything. So if you could each just share, maybe Heather will start with you and then we'll go to Kendall, to just share a little bit about your background, a little bit about um, you know, how you got into the work that you're doing around um, Jews of color and uh, and since you're both in rabbinical school, maybe you share a little bit about that journey too, about what drew you into the rabbinate. Uh, of course, hi, welcome. I mean, thank you for welcoming me into your community. Um, so I came to this work sort of 
um, in an interesting way, because as a professional, as an educator and a school leader, um, this is work that we've engaged in, and I would say I would categorize part of my, the secular part of my life. Um, I am a school leader in the public school system, and so this work is something that we have been really been uh, trying to be purposeful about in that sector of my life. Um, and I think that it was just sort of a moment where we were running up against a wall in my synagogue community, um, where we were having some issues. We had had issues in the past, but we didn't have a mechanism to really um, do anything about it other than just sort of like, oh man, that was a, a negative thing that happened. And now, what do we do? Um, and so I sort of had this epiphany um, after uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, and there was this moment where uh, my community didn't respond. So I'm the president of my synagogue. I've been a member of uh, this community for the past 17 years. Um, you know, I got married and divorced and kids and bar mitzvahs and all of those things. I've had so many life cycle events that have um, happened in that community. And yet after such a horrible incident, um, my community fell silent. And so as the president of my synagogue, I uh, take very seriously making sure that all of the intersections um, and all of the, inter uh, all of the identities within my community feel heard and represented and make sure that when things happen, we are mobilizing and organizing around that. But when it came to me and the community that looks like me, there was silence. Um, and so I had a moment where I sort of, uh, withdrew into myself for a couple of days. And I made the decision when I emerged that I was going to lean all the way in. And then I had this epiphany, why not merge my two worlds? I already do this on a daily basis at my job. Um, and so I created uh, the first iteration of what is uh, my race consciousness series. And so it came out of a moment where instead of stepping out of my Jewish community, um, being Jewish is a, is a major part um, of my identity. And so I was coming, I, I really, it was a really difficult moment because I said, am I going to have to leave my community? Am I going to have to step down um, from my role? Um, at that point, I was planning a bar mitzvah and I said, I might work. Are we going to have to find another place to do this? Like, it was all, all of this was all wrap, wrapped up in this existential crisis. And so I just decided to lean all the way in instead um, and really just share the stories because um, I'm a firm believer that Judaism is not supposed to hurt. And that if Judaism is hurting for a segment of our community, that it's incumbent upon all of us to listen um, and to do teshuva around that in a very real way. Um, and so I was very lucky that my community uh, responded in a positive way. And it's just like, you know, we messed up. How can we do this better? Um, and so it's been uh, this learning, but it was just me uh, deciding that I was no longer okay with status quo. I think that as, and I'm coming from the lens of being a black Jew, um, which is its own unique, uh, has its own unique uh, position. Um, but I think that I've had a lifetime of experiences of microaggressions, downright macroaggressions, um, experienced racism. But I think that it was, I was tired of like my kids coming home from school and saying, this, this is happening uh, on the playground. This is what happens. Both of my, my older two children uh, were both first called the N-word. When they were five, my oldest has only ever gone to day school. Um, and so there are a lot of folks who like to, like to tell themselves that this is not happening in the Jewish community. But when we, when we see this, the only incidents of racism that my eldest child has ever had have been in his day school environments. And so that's a lot to sit with. Um, and I got tired of not of feeling helpless and being able to protect my children um, and having and feeling like they were not um, going to be able to have the same connected Jewish lives as all of their peers. It was not fair. Um, and I'm a firm believer that, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, and so it also led me on my journey to like those similar thoughts is what brought me uh, to want to become a rabbi. 
uh, because part of that is that um, if you see it, you can be it, right? And so a lot of kids who are growing up as Jews of color, they don't have a lot of folks, you know, as an adult, I've, I never had a black rabbi. I never saw a rabbi of color um, until I was an adult. So I've had a whole lifetime where this has not been part of my experience and representation matters. Who's at the front of room matters. Who's sitting at the table, who's making decisions matter. Um, and I wanted to be one of those folks that little kids could look up to and say, and so when their parents say, do you want to be a rabbi? I can be one of those folks that changes that for somebody um, and they can say yes you know because I've seen one I've seen somebody who looks like me in that seat so uh, that's what brought me all the way around to here. Wow thank you so much for sharing um, a little bit about yourself and what brought you into this work um, very very appreciative to hear your to hear your story and I'm gonna get I want to get back to the last you know the last thing you just said in a little bit about representation um, because we and but I want to give Kendall an uh, opportunity to introduce himself to our community first. But I think that's such a, a key, important point. Um, so let's let's bracket that to come back to in in a, in a few minutes. Kendall, welcome. Hello, uh, thank you all so much for welcoming into your welcoming me into your community. Um, it's a true blessing to be with you all. I happen to have learned with Rabbi David Shuck. Um, I have as a student of Rabbi Shuck and also to have learned with Rabbi Jessica Fisher and getting to know Rabbi Zach Sitkin. It's, I, I mean, you all are in such wonderful hands in this community. And I, I hope you all feel as blessed to know them as I feel uh, blessed to know them. Um, so I'm Kendall Pinckney. I am a fifth year rabbinical student at JTS um, where I have the, I don't even know exactly what the word to say for it is, a, it, is it a privilege? Is it something else of being the first black individual to actually matriculate through the program? And God willing, at the end of this year, I will be the first black graduate. Thankfully, we have had Jews of color graduate from JTS, but for any number of reasons, um, there has yet to be um, a black graduate uh, from JTS. Um, a little bit about my background. I grew up right outside of Dallas, Texas. I grew up in a Christian family, um, very much going to church multiple times a week and whatnot. Did not meet my first Jewish person until I was 17 years old. Um, and then somehow ended up at Oberlin Conservatory in College in Oberlin, Ohio, where after a year and a half, uh, I can see a couple of people got animated by Oberlin, so I guess we have some Obies here. Um, <laughs> and uh, in my second year or so, I, I was really drawn to explore Judaism. Um, so I did what I thought was the right thing to do. I dressed up, uh, not quite in a suit, but was definitely overdressed for anything at Oberlin, um, <laughs> overdressed with a Protestant Bible in hand and went to um, a Kabbalah Shabbat Mariv service thinking that it was going to be a Bible study. Uh, it was not. And uh, it was a very weird experience to see people standing, sitting, bowing, and like all of this choreography around Jewishness that I had no idea about. And yet it was also intriguing. And I kept going back to, um, Hillel and kept going back to the Havara and to services and asked questions and had really generous friends who uh, answered all of my questions. So that was kind of my introduction into Jewish community. And then I left Oberlin and realized, oh, Jewish community is so much bigger than the crunchy granola Jewish community of Oberlin. So I studied in Jerusalem for a year and a half really kind of living all of these different experiences all the way from like, oh, I am secular, want to be Israeli to like, you know, modern Orthodox being pretty, you know, from ish, like I, I tried to experience all of the, the range of like, well, what it could possibly be to live Jewishly, and all in order also to understand this notion of Jewish peoplehood, which I did not have a sense of what people had meant until probably like five or six years into my journey um, to becoming a Jew. So, but once that clicked, I was like, oh, 
all of these people, including the people who I normally do not like and probably wouldn't want to talk to, all of them are still my people. And somehow through some kind of alchemy of conversion, they become my people. I adopt their story and they also have to claim me. So um, that was profound for me, a profound realization, a profound education. And in terms of like coming to work around matters of being a Jew of color, that's been more recent. I probably heard the term Jew of color maybe about six, seven years ago. And it was someone else mapping that term onto me in a synagogue space. And I was like, who's a Jew of color? What? I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm black and I'm Jewish and I'm converting, but like Jew of color, what is this? Um, I mean, it didn't offend me, but I, I just didn't know what it was. But then as I started to get deeper into communities with Jews of color, uh, I was like, oh, okay, I see how, even if it's an imperfect term, it does serve as a useful umbrella for like, you know, connecting Jews of certain experiences who when they walk into certain Jewish spaces, they, they share certain, you know, they, they, they share certain experiences. So it's a term that I eventually embraced while also still holding on to my identity as a black Jew who is also a black Ashkenazi Jew because my conversion is in, you know, Ashkenazi uh, tradition. Um, and I, you know, go according to Ashkenazi Nusach amongst other things. But um, yeah, it's, it's been kind of beautiful to just get more involved in JOC, Jew of Color community. Um, and to some extent that probably is related to going to rabbinical school. Um, as I got deeper and deeper into working in Jewish communities in Brooklyn, uh, where I live, I kept getting asked to lead more things, got more involved in my synagogues that I and minions that I was a part of. It's like, I want more time to spend with these texts of this heritage that I have adopted. Um, and the best place to do that is rabbinical school. And JTS was the only place that made sense for me in terms of practice in terms of how I wanted to learn. Um, it, it just all made sense. Um, and somewhere through that process of deciding to go to JTS and being in rabbinical school and feeling like there was kind of a nice alignment there, I also thankfully found a way to bring in my background as uh, a, an artist. So I'm a playwright and a musician. And that is very much a part of the kind of rabbinate that I'm trying to build as well really foregrounding the arts for all folks who happen to be Jews and also for uh, Jews of color who happen to be artists. So that's a little bit about me, a little background and so happy to be with you all. Thank you. So um, before we jump into any other questions, I think that definitions are really important to give context to the conversation that we're having. So if either, if, if either one of you wants to jump in or maybe both in your own ways, could you just give us a definition? When we say Jew of color, what what exactly or who exactly are we are we are we talking about who is who is who are we including under that umbrella of jew of color in your in your understanding of that of that term i think that that can be kind of complicated um because it's um sometimes i think of um like myself as being a person of color right and how I grapple with that, because often um, that label of person of color is defined in proximity to whiteness. Um, and there is, there is uh, an internal struggle that I feel about that term. Um, and some feel the same way about Jew of color. Um, and so there are folks who self-identify that way. Um, there could be folks who are black, Hispanic, Latinx, however, they identify because that's also tense. Uh, all different Asian Pacific Islander. Um, there are folks who are Mizrahi that identify as Jews of color. There are some who are Sephardi who also identify and some that really don't. So it is, it's something that's nuanced. And so the way I like to think about it um, is that for those of us who feel uh, that have been marginalized um, for the color of our skin because we look different. Um, it's sort of a connection between us and it's a very useful term um, in doing this work uh, because then we can really name who it is that we're doing this 
part of the work for in the same way that the LGBTQI plus community is very nuanced and there's a lot there. But when we're talking about the work that has to happen to create safe and embracing spaces for that community, it's a, it's a useful term um, in framing that work. So I think that I can't identify somebody um, as a Jew of color. It's a term that somebody may feel, um, like Kendall said, uh, Jew of color is one that's been new for me to, to wear. I've been a black Jew this whole time. Um, and so that's, so it's different for everyone, but in general, that's, that's sort of the bucket that um, it holds. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I, and I mean, this is part of the reason why I, I love doing any and everything that I can with Heather. This is our second time being together today because uh, she always brings the wisdom and she always brings the nuance of things into it. Um, so in the broadest sense, like Jew of color, you know, it's this broad term that encompasses people of varying experiences, but it kind of stems from this notion of there needs to be some kind of term of a you know, a minority within a minority, even if those minorities have very different experiences. Um, and so I love that Heather really brings the nuance to that. And the only thing that I would add really is that if you want to learn a touch more about it through reading a short article, there's this article by um, the wonderful um, Jew of color leader, um, Shahana McKinney Baldon, who runs Edot a Midwest, um, which is an organization based in the Midwest for Jewish diversity. And it is, um, so it's gonna be posted in the chat just momentarily. Um, and it's worth checking out because this isn't a thing that developed in the last two years. It's actually been around for over two decades. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, you know, something, something that I heard uh, I had the privilege to, to catch a glimpse of this morning's conversation. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I, I signed on to, uh, to, to watch a little bit of it. And I think the presenter, Alana Kaufman, said something really powerful about this that I was hoping you could speak to, which is, you know, I know that many, many Jews here, um, you know, that like, that, and not just here, but in, you know, in the, in the public sphere, feel often uncomfortable with being associated with whiteness because of our experience, especially around white supremacy, have being targets of white supremacy. So the idea of being placed in that category can often feel uncomfortable. But um, Alana framed this really well uh, this morning. I don't, I don't wanna use her words. I can't remember exactly what she says, but maybe you could speak to it better. But for those of us who are thinking, oh, but like if you're defining Jews of color and conversation with white, whiteness or white supremacy, but we, don't, we might not necessarily identify that way ourselves, maybe you could speak a little bit to that, to that feeling or that reality. Yeah, and I think that this is actually one of uh, my joys in creating the race consciousness series, because I think that there's something that's it's nuanced when speaking in the Jewish community specifically because of that proximity to that ownership of whiteness. And so when we think about it as an ethnicity, though we can experience, because I also experience anti-Semitism, I also experience racism. The difference is that a lot of the racism that I experience is within my Jewish community. Um, and so it, it, it does not mean that uh, a white passing Jew, we'll just use that term, um, cannot experience discrimination because they are Jewish. However, in the broader sense of race being a, a social construction, um, when walking down the street, you're just a white person, right? And I, so I used to have this conversation um, with my child, my former husband, um, my children's father, um, because he used to travel a lot for work and he would travel all around the country. Um, and so I said, the difference is, so yes, Jewish, all of that. But if you are going into a place where you know that there is known anti-Semitism, you can take your kippah off and put it in your pocket. This is not going anywhere. So I said, the difference is, as soon as you take your kippah off, you're just white. And people uh, uh, relate to him as a white person, right? Um, and so he can hide that part of himself. I have to deal with my skin color no matter what. 
Um, and so I think that that's a nuance where one has to own the idea in order to really show up and be a race conscious, uh, culturally competent ally one has to own the fact that you can be both of those things at the same time. You can experience anti-Semitism, and that's something that is a concern for all of us, um, but you also benefit from white privilege. Um, and so those two things go to, those two things may be in conflict, but it's not an identity that uh, can be switched off at convenience because as a social construct, that's what other people see. Others, other people see that. Um, so just as I am labeled, whether I like it or not, I'm labeled as black. I have had my own relationships with that throughout my life. Um, how I feel about that. I don't have a choice. People label me as African-American or black, even if I feel like, I okay, can't, why can't I just be American? I don't get a choice. So I think that, that it's just the way the world perceives us. Right. And I mean, that really is the thing. It's like, there are the names by which we call ourselves and the names that others call us. And to not acknowledge the dynamic interplay and the really complicated dance that takes place between those, um, it, it can do harm. And one thing that I want to also acknowledge um, is, so in race being a construct, that means that things, by and what things have the, there's the space for things to change, right? Mm -hmm. So whereas we, some people like to think that whiteness is a fixed category. I mean, I imagine that any number of people here on this call um, can either think back to their own experiences or the experiences of their parents when their whiteness as Jewish people was actually somewhat suspect. They were considered other, especially if you go before World War II. Jewishness was not quite whiteness. And then before that, Irishness and Italianness was not quite whiteness. And yet, because this dynamic of race is so slippery and so sneaky, um, it can change. And so there always needs to be this flexibility to be able to, on the one hand, realize what's the name by which you call yourself. Maybe you only call yourself, I am just a Jew. But then also realize that when you're stepping out into the world, um, you're st like, what? what? What's the thing we always quote? Like, less than 1% of 1%, I mean, I mean, like, you know, as Jews, we're so small um, in terms of being uh, a community in America. So most people are not coming along and just being like, ah, there's a Jew. No, they're like, that's a white person. Though a complexity that gets added to that is like, in the case of, like, let's think about who's often targeted um, in a lot of anti-Semitic attacks. Like, it's either possibly a building that kind of like stands as a marker or when it comes to people's bodies, it's often our siblings who happen to be very observant and very like, you know, in a particular brand of orthodoxy. And so it, it, it's really complicated that it's like the visual of being Jewish, not like you are wearing your kippah, you have on your tzitzis, you have on your black suit, um, you, you have, you know, a wig on. It, like that's where it's, okay, maybe like it can, you can become a um, target um, more so. But one of the things that I also hold that makes it even more complicated is a quote that my good friend um, who I went to grad school with um, said, it's like, so on the one hand, Jews can experience the privileges of whiteness and you still can't yet be president. So it's like, how can you hold that complexity of benefits of whiteness and yet still can't be president. Um, and I think that's really complicated and really hard to hold. And yet, you know, our lives are contradictions and thus is the American reality. If Jews are good at anything, we can hold complexity, or at least that's what I understand. <laughs> it encourages us. Exactly. So it's, it's, yes, so, and, and should... it's because of that that the Jewish community is uniquely positioned to be able to understand exactly. The, exactly. The, this work and the importance of this work. Um, yeah. So, 
Yeah, I think that I think what you what you're saying provides a helpful framework, which is even if we in our experience, because you know, in our in our synagogue, as I imagine the synagogues that you affiliate with, we have people who are Holocaust survivors and people who are children of Holocaust survivors. And it's, you know, that 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 lens of saying, like, what well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, like my like I went through this experience, my either myself or my family, like how could I be a beneficiary of of whiteness, but it's not just about how we feel. It's about how, it's about over time develop how time develops the the boxes that other people put play, place us in, whether we want that or not. And so the, the fact that other people per, may perceive us as white, um, and we can, as you said, Heather, we can sort of hide our Jewishness to some extent. Um, that we have to we have to reckon with that. In a, in a, and you get to check that box off, right? On because that's what happened, right, with the GI Bill. Um, historically, it was an option on the census after that. Um, and so once that box is checked, it, it's a game changer. As Kendall said, historically, there are a lot of immigrant groups who came here that were not white. They, are definite, they definitely are now. Right. Um, and so that, um, that's part of the, the complication in, with American history. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for, for that insight and wisdom. Um, I, I want to pivot a little bit um, because I think, I think Heather, it was either you or Kendall who just said um, a, a, that mentioned about like the impact that these kinds of conversations can have on a community. So I want to just stay there for a moment, which is could each of you share a little bit about um, why you think having conversations like this are so vital um, for the health and, and, and growth of our communities and why you feel like they can have an impact? Mm. I think that these conversations are so vital because um, I don't remember the exact way in which you know the brilliant James Baldwin said it, but it's it, it, it's like the 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 gist of it is like it's hard to change anything, but if you don't face it, you definitely can't change what the problem is. Um, obviously, he expressed it in a much more felicitous way. Um, so if we don't have these conversations, if we don't come together see each other as like call Israel and like actually get into some of the complexity of this, then we actually fracture more and more. And potentially there are generations um, that will continue coming year after year who just find Jewishness to be um, irrelevant, whether that is irrelevant in terms of like their experiences because they happen to be Jews of color or irrelevant, I mean, I've actually been kind of surprised and in, in a certain way kind of moved in a way that I've worked with a number of like college aged um, white Jewish students who really are like moved to act around justice and around racial justice and the ways in which they find themselves on the one hand, both proud of their Jewishness, but also to feel some of the ways in which the parochial concerns of like we Jews are taking care of Jews, that, like they, they almost start to view different generations as like, you're not speaking to me, but there are some of these other groups that are realizing, oh, we are multiracial, multi-ethnic Jewish reality. And so I'm actually gonna go affiliate with them or I'm gonna check out altogether. So it's necessary for us to have these conversations. I think if we actually want to build a really robust, multi-generational, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-everything community. And I think that we have to come to the reality of uh, the original data, right? So the beyond the count data that I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit this evening um, is sort of a follow-up to that number that I think that so many people were surprised that 12 to 15% of Jews in uh, Amer North America identifies Jews of color, which means that it translates to approximately one in seven because the vast majority of the Jewish community has never seen this many Jews of color and have, an, have a misconception that this is something new. Um, Jews of color have been around this entire time. Um, and the think that initial thinking of, well, I've never seen it, so it doesn't exist, was not, uh, so that was the first line of thinking rather than why haven't I seen it? Um, what has happened in our communities where we no longer there? It's like, well, we used to have somebody. Where did they go? Um, and so I think that that's been sort of an awakening of what those numbers have represented um, to 
are different folks. And I think that the reality of the United States and the demographics in the United States are that each subsequent generation we're becoming more multi-ethnic. There are a lot of folks who identify as being multiracial, two or more races. Um, and so our ethnicities. And so I think that we have to recognize that that's our Jewish community too. That's the future of our Jewish community as well. Um, and so in particularly the conservative movement, I know that there is a realization that if we don't embrace more families, we're losing them to other movements that are already uh, a couple of years ahead of us when it comes to um, doing this work. Um, and so I think that that's something that we have to be really real about what that means, that if our current Jews are growing up and they're meeting folks in college and they're connecting with other folks and they're having multi-ethnic Jewish babies, at some point that family unit has to go someplace. And if we do not evolve as a Jewish community, um, we already saw during the pandemic, right? I don't know if this happened in your community, but depending on the level of technology that was accepted um, in our various, various Jewish communities, we saw that people, younger folks, do not have to consume their Judaism in our synagogue spaces. This is a problem across all of the regard, regardless of religion. But um, this is one of those things where the values that our younger folks hold are mirror what Ken Kendall was saying, is that our younger folks are more socially active and they do care about the environment and they do care about these issues. And if our synagogue spaces remain the same, they're literally going to die out because there are younger generations, the millennial generation does not necessarily value synagogue membership and they don't necessarily need all of that because they they express their Judaism in different ways. And if we want to continue, I, I really do believe that in order to pass on our traditions, we have to embrace the folks that are practicing and the way folks are practicing. Um, and so that they raise their Jewish families in our synagogue spaces. Um, and that that's a value that continues um, throughout the generation. So I think that we have to recognize um, that that number is real, that 12 to 15%, and I would hazard a guess that's of the adults at that time. Sometimes I look in my synagogue and being, the, being a black president <laughs> of a synagogue um, is a unique position in that um, when I do the work, um, it means that I am also um, saying, signaling to other Jews of color that this is a safe space uh, for them. And so we do have, I, in my community, I, I have actually more than 12 to 15% Jews of color in the community. But what I will say is that with our kids, there I have about 20% of our adults um, are Jews of color, but we're at about 50% of our kids. And so that's telling you already, <laughs> a generation later, they're already more multi-ethnic than their parents. And so that's the future of Judaism. And so I think that we have to reckon with what that means about what our spaces um, need to look like. Yeah, thank you for that. So it's, it, you know, there's a, there's this idea that, you know, if, if, if synagogues are taking their Jewish values seriously, right, inclusion in and of itself is a value. Right. And we can fight for that value. But what you're adding actually is, is something that even maybe a little bit deeper than that. Like it's great for inclusion, for inclusion's sake, because it makes us more open and welcoming. But what you're saying is that like actually the demographics of American Jewry are changing. And if we are not, if we don't change along with it in the ways that we think about who, 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 um, who is who is Jewish and what Jews look like and what are the racial and ethnic makeups of Jews, we're actually missing the future of Judaism. We're setting ourselves up for to becoming obsolete and extinct. So there's yeah. a, there's this existential reality also of uh, an imperative of trying to understand what like who Jews are in America today. And right, so, and what a Jewish family looks like, right? Yeah. Because like when right. we think and we open the books and we open the articles and we see the people on the TV um, and it's just like, you know, we see all of, you know, Caveller will have an article about <laughs> something like this and they'll be arguing that like this, you know, uh, actor was not Jewish enough or this person was cast that way. And it's just like, okay, but um, that person is black and guess what? They played a Jew and they're Jewish. 
Um, and so until we, we have to start, we have to stretch our mind on what a Jewish family looks like. And we're not yet at the point where um, you can see me and my kids walking down the street and say like, oh man, that's a good Jewish family. Yeah. Um, and we are. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it, it, there's like an interesting, you know, this is, this isn't really, this is off the topic of race for a second, but there's an interesting conversation around Hollywood and, and, and how Jews are represented in Hollywood in general. And as we know, like the archetypal Jewish character is very much, hi, Richie, yeah, thank you. It's very much the, um, like the New York based um, sort of maybe nebbishy kind of like, uh, you know, the nanny. Jewish person. Yeah. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like, and we, as we know, that's a caricature, right? Like not all right. Jews are like that. And, and that's, and, and the, you know, many, many Jews are not from New York and like those cultural references don't actually speak to their experience. And so um, what you're saying is very much in that same, I think that same vein is that we have to understand the makeup of the Jewish community today. And so since you mentioned the Beyond the Count study, um, I'm hoping that you could just, both of you, may, if you're, you know, however aware you are of the study, just take a few minutes to um, enlighten our community about, you know, for those of us who don't know what Beyond the Count study was or is, and some of the, maybe the key findings that came out of that report. Um, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You no, can, I was actually going to, Heather, you you totally um, <laughs> take this. You, you've spent even more time with it. The one thing that I was going to add, especially around, because um, I spent so much of my time with the arts. So when you said like the way in which like in media um, that Jewishness is portrayed, be on the lookout. I know for a fact from knowing certain projects that are in development, that's going to change within the next several years. You're actually going to see more projects with Jews of color where their Jewishness in being Jews of color will actually be like front and center and like part of the like world. In certain cases, they will make, um, in certain cases, they will make a, a, a big deal out of it. And in other cases, it's like, well, of course they're black Jewish people. Of course they're, you know, Asian Jewish people, of course. So it shows this, they're like, even in the world of media, which in certain ways creates the narratives that we have, like mm -hmm. there's even a realization that is taking place there and those stories are being shared. So, you know, let's hop to, um, Heather, no, please, you, you, you yes. take. Beyond the so count. with the Beyond the Count, so that study that identified uh, the demographics of uh, the JOC community where we get that, uh, 12 to 15 percent. There was a, a second study that was done that was beyond the count. So in short summary, and I saw that the link went into the chat already, so definitely check it out because there are a lot of data points that are really important to really think about, um, but it sort of went behind the experience of the folks who, of that 12 to 15 percent, um, and it went a little bit, of, little bit deeper into how we identify how we're connected to our Jewish communities, how, uh, how, like all, how the, ex what the experience of being Jewish is like on a more granular level. And it was commissioned by Stanford um, with uh, black Jewish, or I'm sorry, JOC PhD data analysts, um, a very intentionally like doing that, doing that work. Um, and so, I think that a couple of the things that really stand out um, that are pause points um, for all, so many communities across um, North America are that 80% of the Jews of color on that survey um, expressed that they have experienced this racial discrimination in Jewish spaces, 80%. And so, you know, as I already shared, starting when my kids were five. That's the first time somebody called them the N-word. I can't even tell you how many times I've been called other names uh, or referred to as other things. And so that 80% of those surveyed did that. Um, and so 49% felt or feel like they do not feel like they have this feeling um, of not belonging in white Jewish spaces. And that's something that we have to really sit with and stew with and, and let ourselves be uncomfortable with those numbers and really lean into that those are some large numbers um, statistically. Um, and then it also, it 
undermines a couple of the assumptions because I think that when we talk, because folks are not used to seeing this one in seven, right? There's this assumption that all Jews of color are on the fringe, that we're not connected to Jewish communities, we don't lead active Jewish lives, and it is just not true. So on the survey, it identified that approximately 54% of Jews of color are uh, do attend synagogue regularly. And so I don't like to make comparisons between the Beyond the Count survey and the Pew study, but what I will pull out of the Pew study is that on the Pew study, of the just Jews in America, the one that just came out, 27% of Jews on the Pew study attend synagogue regularly versus 54% on the beyond the count. And so this notion that Jews of color are not tied to synagogue spaces or not active in Jewish life, that's not really correct. Um, and the last point that I like to think about is that there is a notion that every Jew of color has some sort of a conversion story. And that's also not true. So I think that we hold these and there's a lot of like um, reasons that a lot of folks in our community give themselves permission to believe in order to not be responsible for fixing this problem. But the Beyond the Count study identified that over two thirds, I think 66% of respondents have two Jewish parents. They're born Jewish. And so that doesn't include those who are, because I don't want to get into the nuance of what happens when it's one Jewish parent. So look at the study because that, all of that captures a lot of things, right? In the conservative community, we wouldn't recognize somebody who has a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother. So like all of those things, but that means that over two thirds of our community were born this way. So the idea that all of us have a conversion story is just erroneous. Um, and so I think that that's really important to really look at those numbers and really look at all of the different pieces of data and how connected we are, because I think that despite the communities, uh, the experiences that we've had in the communities, we're, we're very educated and active Jews. We try to be, uh, it just doesn't always work out. <laughs> Um, but we're trying to be connected to the Jewish community and it's, a, and the survey will show, um, the survey does show when you read it, um, that it's a very vital part of our identities. It's a very vi vital value that we're trying to pass on to our children. Um, and so I think that, that challenges some, uh, of the core assumptions that folks, um, have already, um, in a really big way, and in a way that we really need to do some reckoning around. And Al, do you have anything you want to add? Nope, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. So, thank you, Heather, for for giving us a little bit of background on the Beyond the Count study and um, and some of the key takeaways from that study that we should be thinking about and sitting with, as uncomfortable as they make us. You know, um, those realities. So. Uh, I, one of the things I want to return back to, you had talked about representation. I think it's come up a few times. Um, and I want to do talk less about Bethel because you're, you've come and you, you speak at Bethel now. And I want to acknowledge that we have an all white staff um, at, and lay leadership at Bethel. Um, and in a world in where, where we know that representation really matters, what are some approaches you've seen um, or recommendations you might make to help us at Bethel um, demonstrate that we can be a community for Jews of color, especially given the human resources that we have. Mm. So, um, I mean, I know from having worked with and like learned from Heather that there are some really specific talkless things that Heather um, is going to be able to share around this. But um, the thing that I'll kind of start with in kind of like the biggest sense is like, um, and this is something that Heather can go into more precisely, it's like, like think about how it is you would explore moving to a different place and joining a new Jewish community. Like what might be the things that you look at, right? Would it be a website? Would it be a friend? Would it be like you would use your networks in order to find out stuff about that place. Um, and 
it's the same thing for Jews of color, like in coming to a space, like we, we do our research. Uh, we try to find out, is this going to be an okay place for me, for my kids? Um, e even in the case of my partner, who happens to be uh, white and Jewish, um, it's like, I, I know that she thinks about like how, like, even that she has that in intention of like, uh, is this going to be a place for my partner uh, that's going to make sense and God willing, um, you know, our children. So th these are things to like think about in terms of like, just think through the process because that will also lead you to certain things that could be done um, to make it a more welcoming uh, place. Um, but since I know that Heather's gonna take care of the talk list, I'm going to focus on like the story, like the stories that we tell about ourselves and that we tell about our communities makes a heck of a lot of difference. It makes so much of a difference. So I would say that part of the work is actually thinking about our stories of who is a Jew and working to understand what our assumptions are, to understand the data, and to start to build a really robust and complex story around that, that makes it to where we actually can take these like tachless steps to make our communities reflect the much more complex reality. Um, because it, it's one thing to be told like, ah, your synagogue needs to, if we know that they're, that one in four um, Jews is a Jew of color, your synagogue needs to reflect that da, da, da. Like if you start focusing immediately on tachless, it's gonna be like, well, I don't know who the Jews of color are. Where do I go? Do I reach out to someone? Am I tokenizing them? And you can start to spiral. Um, but when you start to focus on like, what are the stories that I tell myself about myself and my community? And then start to work on like dismantling some of that and then start being in community with other people of color and other Jews of color and actually developing relationship. Then suddenly you find out oh, there are actually quite a few in our community who felt like this would not be the place for them because they looked on the website and it seemed like it was all white Jews. Um, or because in my case, especially in my work with Amu, the Jews of Color Tour Academy, I mean, I do a lot of pastoral care and there was a lot of trauma that many Jews of color experience um, growing up inside of day schools and um, like after school Hebrew programs. It's like, so many who I know of where it's like, after B'nai Mitzvah, it's like, bye, bye community. So um, I would focus a lot on narrative and relationships. Oh, and I think Heather oh. needs to be uh, unmuted again. She's, she's got some jokes for us. I have them, okay, right, exactly. Um, okay, so I think, so there are a couple of things um, and, you know, I, I think of this the way Kendall said it, it's like JOC shul shopping, right? The things that, that, that often like we look for, the same if you are a young family and you're looking for like, does this place have Tat Shabbat programs and do they have like education programs and it, you look for the things. Um, and so one of the places that I think that you could start is looking at your mission and vision. What are the signals um, that you are invested in doing the work, right? Um, and that you're leaning into the work and this is an important value to your community. Um, it's like one of those, if you build it, eventually they'll come. As Kendall said, it's, there's a lot of trauma that has already happened. There's a lot of damage that has already happened in our community because of all of these experiences. And so it's gonna take a minute for uh, the JOC community to trust that they can try again. Because those same kids who experience those traumas in their after school programs, in their Hebrew programs, in their school environments, and all of those things, um, in their synagogue communities, they're now the adults that are having kids that are now hesitant about sending their kids to it through, through the same experiences. I have folks who have visited our community and they've come without their kids because the trauma was so deep that they were just like, they're in a place where like in that pastoral lens, right? Where folks are questioning whether they're gonna raise their, Jew their kids Jewish at all. 
And so my, my responsibility, it's all of our responsibility to make sure that our families are raising Jewish children. And I said, you will raise her Jewish and you will raise her here. Um, and so the, there's a lot of um, care and nuance. So there's a lot of things that have to be signaled first. So the work that is being done, where does that live? on your website? Where does that live in your public, the things that go out in the world? I know that uh, I've seen that you have programming that's live streamed. And so that means that there's an archive somewhere. So how do you signal that this work is happening? Where in your mission and vision, where in the values, like different synagogue communities call it different things. Mine calls it tent poles. Um, but like whether they're your pillars, what whatever you call them, where is it stated explicitly that that race is one of the values, that leaning into this work is something that you're interested in because we can handle uh, the fact that, the ha that it hasn't happened yet, uh, but that it's a work in progress. And even sometimes just having the humility to say, like, this is something that we're working on. One of my favorite things that's on uh, one of the websites that is in our local Brooklyn area is there's this statement that one, you know, after George Floyd and this community started doing the work and they didn't know what to do. And the rabbi wrote a letter uh, to her community and it said something to the effect that, please join me in this learning and this conversation. I have a lot of learning to do. I'm not exactly sure exactly what this is gonna look like, but I wanna try, please come on this journey with us, with me. And so having the humility to even just post that is a signal that this is a community that, that's at least working on it and that wants to try. Um, and so one of the things that folks don't know exists is that the Jewish multiracial network like actually has, like I refer to it as the green book for synagogues, right? So back in the day, there was a thing, if you're unfamiliar with the green book, um, you know, it was the safe places for black folks to stop and eat and sleep and all of those things throughout the Jim Crow South and all of that time, right? Um, but the Jewish Multiracial Network has a, a method um, that I will not share. Uh, they, they have a method of uh, determining whether or not synagogue spaces are um, safe for Jews of color. Keshet also has one for LGBTQ. So it's like even making the effort to be, to, to like reach out to them. I, if you're not ready, I wouldn't reach out to them like first because uh, they will not tell you what to do. Um, and so once you get to that point, like even taking the step to get yourself listed in on, on there means that I know like if I were going to Phoenix and I needed a place to go for Shabbat, I could like pull up their website and say like, oh, what synagogues are here, which denomination, and and boom, there's a place that I can go. Um, and so I think that it lives there. So like starting and having that conversation with your board, having the conversation with your membership and really like leaning into why it's important. And a lot of that is in our stories. Um, and it could be one-on-one -on -one conversations that have to happen on why do you, why is this important? Why does, did this group that you have, you, this committee want to bring us here for this conversation. Um, at what point, where, why is now the time in your journey where now you're ready to embrace this in your community? And how can you make that, that whole journey public? Um, and so those are, those are some small bites that I can give on places to start because um, this is, it's gonna take a minute for people to come back um, and to trust that it's happening. But if it's something that you embrace that it's a marathon and not a sprint, uh, that it's not like you're gonna put up something and then all of a sudden you're gonna have five new Jews of color join your community, that's unrealistic. But if you think of it as this is a value of our community that when we say our tent is open, our tent is open, it is open. Um, and how do you make make that known? And I think that that's a lot of it is is writing that vision statement and really coming together as a community to say what does that look like for us here and what do we want the world to know about us? Yeah, thank you. So it's it's so helpful. I I, I um like 
if, if we don't have the representation in our, our people power that we have here, we can have representation in at least the way I, I, I from what I'm hearing from you, Heather, the way that we portray ourselves outside mm -hmm. and Kendall, like what you're saying, the way that we talk about ourselves internally, mm -hmm. like and the conversations we have about ourselves, so helpful. And to just and to know and to recognize that this is a conversation that's ongoing. And even and every time you think you've like arrived to the promised land, as we know we know as Jews, you've never really actually got, you know, you never really have arrived. <laughs> There's always something that, that that pushes you out again, that you have to you have more work to do. So right. um, justice, that's, that's, justice shall we pursue. Right. right? Exactly. We have not found her yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's right. Um, so I um, I'm interested in hearing from you a little bit about this intersection, and I, I I think they're kind of connected. At least I'm thinking about them in my mind. The intersection between that you've experienced, maybe in your own personal lives, between racism and anti-Semitism, like the spaces where you've you felt like you know you've shared a little bit with us about uh, being you know be identifying as black jews and the ways that you've experienced racism within the jewish community but i'm curious about the way the, maybe there are maybe the inverse is also true that you have definitely experienced maybe i don't want to speak for you but anti-semitism from the black community or from other communities that you might associate with so i would love it if you could speak on that a little bit and i think part of why the thing why why the reason i think that this is connected to the conversation we were just having about representation is because i know that you know after george Floyd, we did organize a protest here um, in support in support of the like trying to stand in solidarity with the black community, and um, and what we found was that some of the resistance that we met um, internally was around this question of anti-Semitism or perceived anti-Semitism, which is, which was why are we standing with people when no when we are alone, nobody stands with us, mm -hmm. and so I, I think you might be in a position to be able to speak to that really powerfully as, as someone who stands at the intersection, as you said, Heather, of racism and anti-Semitism often. So could you just share a little bit about that with us? Um, sure. Uh, so I think that this is, and this is where the identity in America is quite complicated. Um, and so absolutely, I definitely do. So the same way that um, folks that like you can put your Jew in your pocket is what I used to say to my ex-husband. Um, I also can hide, right? Because in the external community, like literally nobody in my community or outside of my community tags me as a Jew. Um, and so there are things that I definitely do here. Um, and so I have an opportunity to teach on both sides um, and to dismantle some held assumptions on both sides. And so what I say to the, why are we standing up for folks who are not standing up for us? One, that is not a healthy way to see what our um, responsibility is uh, to heal the world. Um, if we are waiting for everyone to be ideologically perfect before we can stand with them, we will be sitting down for a very long time. So it's sort of a, a do unto others kind of a thing, right? And so that somebody has to start that conversation. And I think that sometimes where Jewish communities or predominantly white Jewish communities um, uh, make a mistake is that you only have this one chance to make that first impression. And so I think that a large part of our Jewish community holds this idea um, that uh, racial justice is part of the fabric of Judaism, right? Because we have like the picture of Heschel and ML Hay and like we all stand behind that, but that's disingenuous. Um, and so that's not something like that's not a picture that in the black community, they're not just like, oh, we have a history of being in solidarity with Jewish people. Um, and so there is a disconnect there. And I think that sometimes there's a, a minor sort of savior complex a little bit when we go in and it's just like, what do, does this community need and how can we help? Um, instead of doing the community building and the relationship building and really leaning into the, the needs of the, the whole local community and not just targeting one and saying, what can we give to you? As if communities of color are sitting around waiting for white people to come along and help them. 
Um, and so I think that sometimes there's a perception there that that's how that's that's how the message the message is not received in the same way that it's um, happening. And so I think that that happens when um, communities jump to the social action first. And so in the mm -hmm. series that I created, mm -hmm. uh, there's a reason I start with ourselves because until we have identified our own biases, until we have recognized and reckoned with how we came, how the world came to be the way it is as we're experiencing it and what our role might be uh, and be honest with that within ourselves, then we're doing, we're going out of ourselves before we have even like settled with and, and grappled with those inner issues. And so then we go and then we make a misstep. And so now we've committed a microaggression and we say something like, oh man, you were so articulate and then shut down and you will not have an opportunity to reach out to that community again. And so I think that starting with that internal work um, and really, really leaning in and getting uncomfortable. I call it armpit sweating because it's really uncomfortable. We are acculturated to not ever, not just not talk about race. We're not supposed to notice it in the first place, not in public. The idea that we're breaking, the barrier that we're breaking down is the taboo of talking about it in mixed company because we talk about race all the time. We just talk about it with like in our own groups, right? Um, and so to, to reach across the racial barrier and to have those conversations, you have to have that first you have to identify your own implicit bias. You have to do that work within the community. How has it shown up? Really revisit those stories that happened in your own Jewish community where um, there is a Shabbat dinner and uh, you had a Jew of color who came and then somebody said something to them and they never came back and really lean into those moments and unpack those moments and say what happened there and how can we plan within ourselves to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And once you're settled in that work, um, then reach outside. But it all starts with, change starts with us, right? It starts with, uh, like my dad said, change begins with you. You have to, to fix it here um, and really like connect with it and be real and get it out of your head and into your heart first. Um, before you can reach outside of the community. And the second thing that I will say is that after George Floyd, a lot of folks reached out to the black communities, but one place, and I remember being in a webinar that JTS put out, and I think I even sent Kendall a message where it was everybody's thinking about uh, this external relationship with like the black community out there and not the black community right here. Um, and so we are in a position where we're bridges here. Um, and so that was skipped because we hadn't reckoned with the 12 to 15%. Before then, we're now reaching outside of the community and we're just like, let's go find some black people to help. Mm -hmm. um, when we've damaged relationships with people of color who are within our communities already. Um, and so I think that that's where it gets complicated, where it's like, yes, and you definitely want to identify the projects that social justice projects um, that your community wants to take on while you're doing this learning, right? So you're do it, you're trying to do the community building, you're trying to do all of those things, but you have to like sort of fix it with in-house first um, before you go too far outside, because if there is a misstep, you can't, you can't take it back. Can you, exactly. uh, sorry, Kendall, I want to give you an opportunity to, to but I, something that you said, Heather, on that experience of like J JTS in particular, um, what, it, what can we do? Like, what's, what does that look like, that work internally? Like, what would have, what would have signaled to you in that moment when JTS tried to put together that, that um, program that would have, that, that would have shown you that they're, they're interest, they're just as interested in doing that work internally as they are externally? So, I mean, not, and not to pick on them because it was a really great program. Um, but even on that panel discussion, there were rabbis, there was a pastor, but there was no black Jew. So even just having like, just like that's representation right there, like recognizing that there are people who hold both of those identities. Um, and so, and having that be part of the conversation. So I think that, you know, that that's part of it too, is just recognize, like, when we think about who we're trying to include, we also have to take a pause and think about who might be missing. Um, and so that's a group that is, uh, you know, we're often a group that's missing. 
Um, and so I think that for me, that would have made a, a difference is having somebody who was both black and Jewish um, at, speak on that panel as well, because it's not, it's not just um, rabbis making relationships with their local like Baptist ministers. It is also, um, there's a lot, there, there are Jews of color right here already. Right. Thank you. Yeah, can you? Yeah. And uh, that's so important because one of the things that Heather said um, so beautifully is like, you always have to ask like, who is missing from the conversation? And another way of phrasing that is like, to think about it of like, who are the people who are on the borders? So there are communities, there are so many, like I have been trying, I, it's been kind of like my mission to get people to stop saying the black community and the Jewish community and start saying black communities and Jewish communities, um, because honestly, we are not monolithic. Let's be real. There are certain Jews who you've met where you're like, not my Jews, not my Jews. And so like, we have like, e even though we are, you know, like, you know, I'm Israel and all that stuff, there are these uh, major differences. And honestly, the real reason that I bring it up is because like, if we recognize that, we should always be attuned to like, okay, when certain groups come together or when we imagine that certain groups could come together, there are probably at least a good handful. And since we're talking about a world of billions, that means like hundreds to thousands to possibly even millions of people who actually exist at the borders, who are part of those groups, who are part of black communities and Jewish communities. So that's kind of one of the first things. Um, to get back to the, the question of like, um, anti-Semitism. Well, you know, one thing that I think that is often not under, not well understood, and this relates to the notion of Black communities, is regionalism. Like, regions are very, very different. I'm a person who grew up in Mesquite, Texas. I didn't, there, I said, I didn't meet a Jewish person until I was 17, at least as far as I could tell. Um, sure, I would have had to drive 40 minutes north um, in order to meet them, but they didn't. And when James Baldwin wrote his very piercing and beautiful article, why, um, why Negroes are anti-Semitic, um, he was living in the experience of growing up in an urban center where there were many Jews who he came into contact with. And if you haven't read it and you think you know what it actually says, I would encourage you to read it because it actually goes to a really beautiful and loving place um, that also deals in some real truth. So recognizing the differences, now, why do I say recognize regional differences? Because I, I have seen that there can be a difference between what I would even call anti-Judaism versus anti-Semitism. So I grew up in such a way where my perception of Jews was like, Jews were a category I thought about because I was in a particular kind of Christianity. I didn't actually know Jews as human beings. So it's like, the things that I might have said that might have been perceived as maybe anti-Semitic were actually like, oh, this is kind of Christian hegemony that had been filtered through my Christian experience and was coming out in a certain way. And when I encountered a Jewish person, they were like, this is really anti-Semitic. When actually it was like, oh, this is like, you know, the, some of the really unfortunate things that Christianity has done in thousands of years that get passed down. Somehow it ends up in my family and I end up speaking that myself before I know better. Um, so that's one difference. Um, in terms of anti-Semitism, well, you know, I'll just say it like anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. I, you experience it in white communities, you experience it in black communities, you experience it in Latinx communities, just like you experience um, anti-black racism in any number of communities. So I am not here to justify anti-Semitism. Um, it is, it, I mean, it, it is truly like a cancerous, um, you know, thing that exists in our world. And because that is a reality amongst certain folks, it should not lead us to say then, well, we're going to discount the perspectives of Jews of color, we're going to discount the perspectives of people of color. Rather, it should lead us to say, okay, there's something here that I don't get, but guess what? There are people who are in my community, people who are adjacent to my community, who I could be in relationship with and actually get a bit deeper into this and what it means. And one thing I'll also just mention is I, I wrote um, an article a little over a year ago or so for the um, Wexner Foundation 
um, called Where Have You Been Since Selma? And this ties into another thing that I just want to emphasize because it's so important, um, even though Heather already said it, is like looking back to the civil rights era and looking back to, well, Martin Luther King Jr. and Heschel, they walk together and that's good. If we're looking back over 60 years in order to find where there was like solidarity and unity, then that really says something. We can't always be looking back to 60 years ago. The, and I have spoken with Black folks, even, and I'll, and I'll be very transparent, even in visiting certain, um, uh, I was in a fellowship where part of the contour of the fellowship was to attend to APAC policy conferences. And I'm speaking with Black leaders who were there. Um, and they're saying like, it's so interesting. They're always telling us about Heschel and King. It's like, who is Heschel? He was one of 20 something thousand people who were there with King, like, why are they always telling us about this and why do they not show up for us? So it's, we've got to get beyond that. It's not even mythology because Heschel and King actually did have a deep and abiding friendship, but we just can't let that stand in for our action or inaction. We, we have to do more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he oh, Heather, let me unmute you. There you go. Sorry, I do have a four-year-old uh, who's up past his bedtime. Um, so I, I love what Kendall just said. And I think that that's where um, I have to do, where I do some of the educating on the other side, right? Because I work in a predominantly Black neighborhood in Brooklyn um, where people of color, I should say, um, live in proximity to a certain segment of our Jewish community. And so in correcting a lot of the anti-Jewish sentiments that exist, it is more relational. Um, and I am also here not to justify any of that uh, behavior. Anti-Semitism is an anti-Semitism. Um, but I think that sometimes it gets muddled um, and that proximity uh, to real lived experiences, because I also know people of color who are living in neighborhoods and they happen to have landlords who are not treating them very well um, and they happen to be Jewish. So they hate those Jews. Um, they have people who they're living in proximity to, to certain folks who, unfortunately, they're getting spit on when they go shopping. They get rocks thrown at them, and that is a very real experience that they are having. Um, and so I think that that proximity and that regionalism uh, nuances the conversation. And again, I also agree, uh, read the article, because that's that's the experiences of that some um, communities of color have with some Jewish communities. It's not all, it's not, it's not hegemonic on either side. So it's, it can be nuanced and complicated and anti-Semitism is very real. And I just don't think that that's, that, that can't be the, the excuse that's used for why we don't, why we shouldn't listen. We want people to stand up for us no matter what. So we have to stand up too. The one last thing I would add to that is it's important to also realize in us talking about regionalism, do not map the experience that we're talking about right here onto Jews in France or to Jews in England or in South America um, or necessarily in Israel and Palestine. Like don't map this, like we're being very specific here. And so I, I, I just wanted to like draw yeah, some attention I agree. to that it's, as well. That's part of the American Jewish experience. It is very real. I can walk around with my with my pendant that has my Hebrew name on it. I could wear it out of my shirt and feel perfectly safe. That is, that's, that's the American Jewish privilege that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, for transparency's sake, I, I'm in this work now of trying to, you know, personally of trying to build these, these very real relationships. And in fact, on Monday, I'm speaking on a panel with um, some members of, uh, with a few other clergy from local um, black churches here in New Rochelle at Iona College, which is the one of the local colleges mm -hmm. in New Rochelle. Um, and we are talking about exactly this, which is 
the, um, you know, right, if, if our image of what Black and Jewish relations were is like this, oh, the heyday of the 1960s, well, it's like, okay, well, that was 60 years ago. So, like, that was the, if that was the heyday, like, we have a problem, right, because we, we need to resolve the issues that are in our communities now. Um, and so try to restart those conversations in a real way that like deepens our relationship and our connection to one another. And so my question for you, because you're you are on it, like you are living your lives in it built into your bodies is this intersection between these two communities. And I would love to learn from you about like how do we have conversations that aren't just, you know, my experience has been that they're often superficial on the surface, and maybe that's where they need to start. But um that, but that can't be where they end, right? They have to go deeper mm -hmm. into like the real issues that our communities have with one another. We need to be, um, we, need, we need to be able to listen and hear the ways that we contribute to a dynamic that, that, is, that is dissatisfying and unhealthy. And how do we also like share our, like the ways that we, you know, the, like our also our experiences of ways that we feel like we aren't, we aren't cared for in the ways that we'd like to be. So um, I would love to hear your ideas on that. Sure. So I'll uh, start by sharing specifically through my focus um, in the arts. So I think that part of the way we get there, like, is actually through culture, art, and media. Um, now, ultimately, those things do not have the power that legislation has. So I don't want to you know, be Pollyanna-ish and be like, oh, a story will change. No, um, but it has a great impact. So I think one of the ways to start getting there is through, through creativity, through art, through the art that we promote, that we foreground. So, I mean, I'll just briefly say, and I mean, I know it was mentioned kind of in my intro that, so I, along with JTS, who is the um, lead sponsor of this program I'm going to mention, we just launched the workshop, which is North America's first arts and culture fellowship featuring um, professional artists who happen to be Jews of color, indigenous Jews, um, and Jews of Sephardi and Mizrahi background. Um, these are wonderful, wonderful artists who are doing great stuff off Broadway, on Broadway, have deals with Disney, et cetera, et cetera. And part of the reason that I wanted to start this, other than just loving art, is I'm like, this actually changes the conversation. I don't know if any of you saw, you can maybe even wave your hand, like if you saw the Puppy for Hanukkah video by David Diggs over this past Hanukkah, like it, like it does something so subtle. You have all these children of color who are talking about wanting a puppy for Hanukkah and they're not making a big deal of like, I'm a Latino Jew and I want a puppy for Hanukkah. I am a black Jew and I want a puppy for Hanukkah, no something super subtle. So when, when I think about how do we maybe start to have some of these conversations and get into it, I think actually art can be so helpful. And the clearest reason I'll say why is because when we start talking about um, in it, either through a discussion group or especially if it's framed as a debate, please never frame, frame these things as debates. Um, what happens to people? Suddenly their shoulders are hunching up, their arms are crossed. They're looking at each other like this, sizing each other up. There's no space to learn and to be human. But think about when you go to see a show on Broadway. Think about when you go, you see a dance, like you're in the, you, uh, you kind of relax. You're able to breathe a bit more openly. So I, I think that art, culture, and media can really be a way to start to have some of these conversations. And I know in my perspective from speaking with other people who are like BIPOC, so Black Indigenous people of color, who then see things where they see like a Jew of color presented on a stage, they're like, I had no idea. Kendall, tell me more about this. And I'm like, gladly. So I think that's a place where um, space can open up. And the last thing that I'll say um, about so there's one thing about hearing someone else's story, but about not having our stories heard. And I've heard a number of um, Jews who happen to pass for white say like, well, wh when do I get to tell my story? And that is super real. Like to not have your story heard when you feel it so deeply is really painful. And we're kind of coming into this new reality where suddenly like people of color are being heard in different ways. Um, and you've maybe even heard people say like, you know, it, it's our turn now. Now, even though I don't exactly subscribe to the like, it's our turn now, um, you know, as a phrase, 
I do think that there's something to be said about like, there are a number of Jews who benefit from white privilege in taking those extra 20 minutes, or maybe it's like, maybe in the first conversation, you're not talking about your experience. Maybe it's in the fifth conversation that you talk about your experience. And guess what? It's good if it's in the fifth conversation. Why? Because that means you're actually developing a relationship and it doesn't stop at, we meet for an hour and then we never speak again. So I think that there's a kind of wisdom to waiting a bit, because I tell you, if you show yourself to be in for into it for relationship, oftentimes, not all the times, oftentimes you're gonna receive that back. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if I could say it better than that. Um, I think that it is, it's, it's the power of uh, the story sharing. Um, and I think that, you know, an exercise, you know, might be just, you know, writing down these experiences and getting into the practice of centering the group that you're focused on. Because I think that it's like, sometimes we're listening to stories and we're just waiting for the opportunity to share our trauma. Like, okay, but this has happened to me. Um, and we don't sit long enough. Um, there's an organization <laughs> that uh, approached me about something and it was like, it was as if race was their theme of the month. And then they started this school year with it. And then by November, they were on to something else. They were done. They had cured the racism um, in about six weeks. Um, and so I think that we don't sit with it long enough because we just really want to tell our story. And so I think that get into the, I, I encourage people to journal about it. I encourage people to like, when they get into those moments where they find themselves in their headspace or their heart space, or they're like feeling like something is hitting them in their, 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 that moral space that you sit down and then you write down what's coming up for you and like, really like tease that apart so that you can figure out why is it that I couldn't stay in that story. I couldn't hear that person's story. Um, and so, I mean, just listening, because I think that the more we're able to share stories, I mean, Judaism, we're an oral tradition, like the storytelling, that's how we have survived this long. Um, that's why services are three hours. Um, we're telling a lot of stories. <laughs> um, and so that I think that we have to like really like apply that across the board. It's not just some, something that exists in one area. It's because as a Jewish community, and if we think about this as like the way we're acculturated um, in proximity to different things, um, I think that when we're part of an oral tradition, that means that that oral storytelling, the music, all of that, that's how our neurons make connections to new information. We're, we're raised, cultures that are raised with this kind of storytelling um, as part of their fabric, that's how our, our brains function, right? And so if we lean into that, then we're also leaning into the reality that that's how we're gonna make relationships with each other, right? You have the folks who, you know, that's what we're doing and synagogue spaces is we go, but then it's what happens over uh, Kiddush. That's what's getting people to stay. It's those conversations. It's like, I don't know about y'all, but there are times where I cannot wait for services to be over because I can't wait to talk to my friends about the stuff that happened during my week. Um, and so like all of that stuff, we're telling stories constantly, but we don't often tell the difficult ones and we don't give our communities space to really um, sit and like talk about it. That's one of the ways my community uh, for MLK Day, um, we actually uh, did something different where we just told stories. And we told the stories of the social justice uh, initiatives that, that mean something to us and why, what experiences led us to those work, the, that work. And it brings us closer because if we think about it, there are people who are in communities with each other. We've been in communities with each other for 30, 40, 50 years. And we only know the things that we've asked. We don't know each other even. Yeah. And so giving space to tell each other's stories and all of those things and asking questions that we've not asked each other before. Um, I think we learn more about each other. We learn how to listen and we make connections. Um, and those connections are what does 
that's that's what's going to cause this work to grow. It's beautiful. Thank you both so much for your insight, your wisdom, your sensitivity. I, I, I think I can speak on behalf of the entire Bethel community. We're very grateful to have you. I want to be conscious of time. It's now nine o'clock. Um, so this it feels like this conversation flew by, um, which means for me, at least, that that felt like it was really productive and, and enlightening. So thank you. Um, and since you're both rabbinical students, uh, I, I want to, and, and as Jews, we love bl giving blessings and we're, we're people of blessings. I, I Maybe I can open it and turn over to you to share one last thought if you had a blessing for our community, maybe as a takeaway or something that we can hold on to for the work that we're now trying to engage in. Um, to be to be more inclusive, to be more sensitive to the experiences and needs of the Jews of color within our community. What would your blessing for our community be? Mm -hmm. I think that my blessing would be, um, it's one that's trotted out a lot, but maybe we don't acknowledge just how darn hard it is. May you all be blessed with the gumption, the stick to whatever the word is, to actually not desist from the work. You already have heard so many quotes of, you, you know, pure chaos vote, and it's so hard to not desist, but you're not free to desist from this work. So may you be blessed with all of the energy um, and all of the passion, the love, whatever it is you need. May you be blessed with whatever you need to not desist. And I will just add to that. Um, to really, uh, may you be blessed with the intestinal fortitude um, to, and a lot of deodorant um, to withstand <laughs> these moments of discomfort because it's uncomfortable. Um, and to really just listen, uh, we listen, right? When we say the Shema, but like listen to hear. Um, and really take it into our hearts. And may you approach this with open minds, open hearts, um, and really know that you have the power to change the entire world. We have the power to change the whole entire world. Amen. I wanna thank you both so much for your time and for joining us. And uh, I wanna wish everybody who came tonight um, a, good, a good evening. And I hope that you'll, you'll, you'll take what you heard tonight and use it as an opportunity to continue in this work together. Um, so thank you and, and be well and Shabbat Shalom.